This is February 12, 2015, and here is CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. If you look at the voice screen and look at the schedule, we are at day number 12 of the semester, and this is still week number 6. Now, this week, we are concerned with the very interesting topic of web attacks and internet vulnerabilities. Welcome back, Anna. And also, ethical issues of hacking and cracking. Well, on Tuesday, we introduced us some of these interesting topics, okay? Including helping you to understand the meaning of Wi-Fi security, and also some part of the ideas on the vulnerabilities rather technical, but still got a big picture of that. And we will come back to help you to understand how to create a digital story towards the end of this class by helping you to go through a very brief but very informative video on how to make the best use of a PowerPoint with voice narrations. So you need to record your voice over the PowerPoint and play your PowerPoint at the end of that answer. Very interesting digital story. This is only one example of doing digital story like this. Later on, we will introduce another method, all right? Well, today, we would like to help you understand a little bit more about hacking, and this is day number 12. And instead of going through some formal um, educational pieces to help you understand what is meant by hacking, I would like to invite you to watch a documentary which is about 15 minutes, okay? And at the end of the, doing that, I expect that each one of you will just create some ideas inside your brain, just like after going to the cinema and watching a movie, okay? And then try to put that ideas into your journals and share that in the public discussion forum, uh, also in the peer discussion forum with your learning partner. Uh, we have a number of interesting documentary to show you, and actually it comes from the documentary link here. All right, so uh, it comes from Not Spring, and uh, I still love those documentaries. So I, I used to save this particular semester. The number of documentary here about the real life uh, situations created by hackers and some of the measures uh, provided by the government. And today we're going to see a very interesting documentary which is actually produced by the Discovery Channel a couple of years ago. And it's called Worth Your Time. Hackers, they're the outlaws, and what about the angels, okay? So we're going to spend time and let you enjoy this wonderful uh, documentary for 15 minutes. And then we come back to help you to see how we can produce a digital story with the PowerPoint, which your user used to do some presentation slides. So um, enjoy that. And of course, the number of documentaries here, which are also very good, but we start with this one, okay? Past 20 years, a new breed of people has been evolving. They have their own culture, their own technology, and their own languages. Among them are pirates and thieves, celebrities and philosophers, lawbreakers and police, heroes and villains. They operate all over the world, but their real home is cyberspace. And now there's a conflict in cyberspace between its outlaws and its angels. This is the inside story of the very different missions which now drive the diverse breed of people known to the world as hackers. Twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week. A war is being fought on the web.
Dennis Treese leads one of the teams of frontline defenders positioned around the globe, ready to spot and neutralize the latest attack. This is the Global Threat Operations Center. This is where we monitor the hacker threat 24 hours a day on four continents. It's like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. Minute by minute, hour by hour, every attack is analyzed. Any one of them could be the precursor to a bigger onslaught, fired by a hacker anywhere in the world. We had uh, just about 400 pre-attack probes. Uh, in that hour, 1,500 denial of service attacks in that hour. In the last year, the team have intercepted 83 million hacker attacks aimed at the corporate networks they protect all over the world. Key is flying through an asteroid belt all the time. He's constantly being uh, inundated with, you know, decisions to go around these things up, over, uh, etc. What is it? Is it going to hit the ship? And if it does, is it big enough to do us any damage? It's a computerized game. The bad guys against the good guys, if you will. The emergence of internet good guys like Dennis is the result of a series of attacks by the bad guys, often inflicted against high-profile targets over the past 20 years. One of the first was launched by the legendary Captain Zap. The man behind the comic book image was barely out of his teens when he put himself into the Hacker Hall of Fame. You just mentioned Captain Zap, and they go, old history, oh my god, bow. The target of Captain Zap's hacking was the computerized charging system at AT&T. The telephone rates are too high, just in general. So why not reduce the rates for some people? Or all people? To gather intelligence for his mission, Captain Zap went looking for a way into the phone system. We would go dumpster diving at the phone company offices late at night. Because they don't throw out food, they don't throw out garbage, they throw out manuals. A huge box of weather protected data that I can come after and get from you. It kind of gives you a good snapshot view of their daily existence, morning, noon, and night. Armed with the hacker's ammunition, Captain Zap got to work. Sit down in front of the terminal, turn it on, and start hacking. And spend hours and hours trying to get in. And then once you got in, you were, you know, do you want to play a game? Well, you would dial into their maintenance ports. And um, because there was no protection back then, the maintenance ports would automatically answer. The system would come up and identify itself as, hi, this is the Ardmore switch. Uh, number five ESS, lock on password, guest, guest, you're in. Captain Zap fashioned himself as a modern day Robin Hood, an electronic outlaw. We decided that we were going to change the clocks and the switches around the country so that everybody got free long distance or discounted long distance. Captain Zap succeeded in changing the clocks in the national telephone charging system giving everyone discounted calls in peak time. In hacker terminology, he owned it. I knew more about the phone company switch than they did. In Captain Zap's hands, inside AT&T's computers, day became night. And night became day. changed their clocks so that it was an exact 12-hour difference. Millions of Americans started saving money, but none of them knew it. Neither did the phone company. Ian was one of the pioneers. Ian was one of the first people to recognize the bad things that you could do with computers. He didn't have a lot of people going before him that he had to emulate. Now he's sort of an original. 
Now he's one of the first generation of hackers, the people that figured out how to do it when figuring out how to do it was really difficult. Captain Zapp had discovered he could hack almost anything from almost anywhere. A career of mischief making had begun. According to Wired Magazine, the top hack ever done by any hacker was the AT&T time clock hack. They consider that the finest hack ever. What Captain Zap had done was only discovered when the next set of phone bills started going out. But by then, he disappeared back into cyberspace. He wasn't caught for 18 months. I was naturally curious. I could have solved drugs or I could have... Um, stolen cars or been a rock musician, but no, I decided to become a techno freak. And it was a whole lot easier and there were no laws against it. 20 years later, there are laws against it. NYPD Computer Crime Squad has a growing team of detectives, expanding to deal with the weight of the work they face. A computer forensics lab backs them up. Sergeant Jimmy Doyle runs the squad, and he sees most hackers as people who use new tools to commit old crimes. Basically, what you have is an individual that may do uh, web defense use, break into that website, change the page a little bit. That would be the equivalent of graffiti artist. Uh, then you'd have someone that would break in to steal something, like a burglar. Come up a little bit more, someone who um, wants to commit crime, who's going to use the skills to, to steal money. And as you see, you're going up and up. And then I guess the top of the pile would be the, the cyber. Uh, someone wants to create a great amount of fear through their skills by taking down power grids or attacking financial institutions. They would be the, the top of the pile. In the old days, criminal outlaws hid behind masks. These days, they hide behind computers. From crime is way back is when you have your, your Western your Western robberies and someone will run in, they would try to stay anonymous. They would put masks on because they'd be hard to identify themselves. Now, if you take that and fast forward it to the year 2002, it's the same basic principle. I mean, you know, you don't have a person putting on a mask, they're sitting behind a computer. At least one hacker does hide behind a mask as well as a computer. KP fears British police want to speak to him about an electronic break-in at a cell phone company. He went one step further than Captain Zapp and increased the bills of people he didn't like. I did look up several people that was uh, uh, disagreeing with it, uh, trying to through that database and uh, made several slight changes to the building records, but nothing so conspicuous as to be noticed. Turning the service off. Blacklisted. It was great. I was sat up until four or five in the morning just knowing that I was the one person that was doing what I was doing and nobody could even come close and touch me. In the battle to track down the hackers, the forensics team at NYPD used the electronic equivalent of fingerprinting. In the 21st century, the scene of a crime is often the hard disk of a computer. Suspects' hard drives are routinely seized or cloned. What we do uh, on occasion is either go in and use these devices to make an exact copy of the suspect's hard drive and then bring it back here for analysis. They think they're protected by this screen, but it's pretty much, you know, it's like chasing the invisible man. Even the invisible man needs a footstep or two, a footprint or two, and you follow along. The explosion of online outlaws has prompted the NYPD to beef up its computer crime squad. It's now the force's fastest growing team. Man, I'll get back, guys. <laughs> but as fast as the digital detectives deploy their hardware, the Black Hat hackers have developed software which helps them scan for security holes and vulnerable systems day and night. Oh, yeah. Scan networks 24 hours a day on the computer sitting in the flat on a clock basis. That they'll up using four different phone lines and look for codes for me, and I come back, get in, 
the sea with the fair, and you're going to find that secret hole that nobody else will find, and you will get in, and you will be spotted there, and they will never catch you. To keep up with the Black Hats, every morning the White Hats at the Internet Security Services Global Threat Team hook up for a live briefing. They share intelligence on hacker activity worldwide with colleagues across the globe and at the FBI. They need to stay in constant contact as new vulnerabilities appear which they know hackers will find and exploit. Anything more like two megabytes is going to crash on the spot. Once briefed, they agree on the level of threat the internet and its users face from hackers in the next 24 hours. Okay, great. So we'll notify everybody that we'll stay at 1-1. We're on one This morning, they've set the alert con level at a routine level 1. But even at this level, they calculate that any new computer that is not defended when it goes online will be attacked in less than a day. At alert time 1, an unprotected computer will be compromised within 24 hours of connecting it to the internet. 20 years after Captain Zap changed the clocks at AT&T, Dennis's team is fighting off hacker attacks at the rate of 2 a second. hacker attacks has given birth to a new profession. Brian Holyfield is a 26-year-old with a different kind of Wall Street career. He's an ethical hacker. He and his team spend their days being paid to try to break into the computers run by some of the biggest names in the Fortune 500. They are called the Tiger Team. Well, Tiger Team is a group of, of computer security professionals that a company hires to try and break into their networks from the internet. And the reason they do this is that they want to make sure that they can identify all the potential security issues. That way they can minimize the risk of someone that's uh, an enemy of the company, for example, doing the same thing. They call themselves ethical hackers, the most angelic of the angels. But on a daily basis, Brian is paid to lie and cheat his way into whatever information he can find. Today, with the blessing of his client's boardroom, Brian gets ready to become Will the Hacker. Hi, Jim. This is Will Rogers over in uh, IT. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Uh, you got a couple minutes, or did I interrupt? Is this a bad time? Okay, great. Brian's mission is to get unsuspecting employees to reveal their passwords. He tells them he's from their own IT department. He's pretending he's checking that their passwords are suitable for changes planned for the network. None of it's true. It's really designed to make your life a little bit easier. So, Surprisingly, the technique frequently bears fruit. The way we're going to implement this system, it might restrict the type of characters, whether it's letters or numbers that you can use. So, so for example, what you know, what exactly is the password that you're using? And I'll see if it, if it will actually work with the system we're going to implement. Okay. Brian has successfully convinced numerous employees to hand over their passwords. He can now use them to unlock the company's secrets. You can do a lot of damage with the information that we see, and, and there's a lot of privileged information that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So you've really got to have a, a strong sense of ethics. We could obtain, let's say, access to a, a company's credit card database. Well. You know, your typical hacker out there is going to take the credit cards and try and sell them somewhere and make a profit off of it. We're not. We're not. We're, we're just going to you know, document how we were able to obtain access to that information. We're going to recommend to our clients how to fix it. The emergence of ethical hacking as a morally upright way to earn a living amuses Captain Zap. But it's a job he'd happily do for nothing. The money is kind of a, just the icing on the cake for all of it. The money pays for the toys that you get to buy. Hacking is actually the best reward. But being paid to be allowed to commit crime 
is absolutely genius and American. It's a lot tougher than one would think. I mean, you know, trying to keep a straight face and trying to lie is, is not that easy for someone who's, who's pretty honest. Ethical hackers don't have the mindset that they are above board nice people. You hire an evil, rotten son of a bitch if you want a job done. Right? It comes down to this. Dirty deeds done really expensive. And that's the way it should be. You know, learn to hire the thief to tell you how to steal something. Don't hire a cop. But 70% of hacker attacks are never reported to the police. Instead, many of the biggest businesses turn to Alan Brill. He's a former intelligence officer who runs the high-tech crime team at the world's largest private detective agency, Crawl. I'm on the way, I'll be there as soon as I can. Day and night, Alan's team is poised with mobile hacker detection kits, helping corporations stop the hackers and keep the break-ins quiet. We work for the corporation. We can help them to understand without having to go to government. Once you go to government, they really control the case. Will they take the case? Who's going to prosecute? What publicity will there be about it? In this day and age of volatility in the markets, that's not always something you want to take a chance with. But you can't afford not to know what happened. Their job is to out-hack the hackers. Breaking passwords, cloning hard drives, seizing suspect drives. Alan's computer forensics team is made up of people who could easily have turned their own talents to hacking. There is a difference. The difference is this. I think the typical computer forensic specialist is somebody that has that skill set, but whose moral compass has rusted on good. They may be on the side of the angels, but keeping quiet about hacker attacks suits some other white hats too. The system administrators who guard most computer networks often choose to keep their own bosses in the dark when they discover the black hats have scored a hit. Absolutely, there's a lot more that goes on. A lot of people, you know, job security, they have a fear that, you know, if their boss found out that uh, they left the vulnerability open in the system, upper management might not understand. Anxiety among computer security professionals is now so great that every year hundreds of them sign up for special classes. It's where the white hats come to learn how to outsmart the black hats. The students come from all over America. They have to be closely vetted because this is hacking school. If you can't think like the hackers, then you can't uh, figure out what it is they're trying to do. Probably my biggest nightmare would be that hackers breaking into my network and uh, publishing financial information or something about my company. What would happen to me? Would get yelled at a lot, probably get fired. Seriously. While James worries about keeping his job, Pete White, his fellow student in the extreme hacking class, is anxious about his workplace too. Around the clock, Pete's responsible for keeping hackers from getting at the confidential patient data in a hospital in downtown Houston. It's my job. Uh, we're responsible for making sure that uh, being in a hospital environment, that patient data doesn't get out to the general public. Your reputation is based upon your ability to keep patient data confidential. And if we violate that, then we're out in business for much longer. It would make for a very bad day. In the extreme hacking class, Brian Holyfield, the ethical hacker, is one of the teachers. Within a couple of hours, he and his team have got the students hacking. They are hacking, and they are also learning how to protect against each hack that they carry out. They are real-world examples, and they are always, we're always updating the material so that it accurately covers what's happening out in the wild. 
the bad guys have to find one way in, the good guys have to find all the ways in. Thanks to Brian and his colleagues, after four days, a new team of angels is ready to face up to the outlaws. The teachers have to hope none of the graduates will swap sides. Using it for bad, uh, I don't do that. I, mean, I don't understand why you, you know, what's the, the thrill of going and breaking someone's systems, you know. Unfortunately for the hacker school's passing out parade, a new generation of black hats across the world understands the thrill only too well. The White Hats have to be ready for an attack from anywhere. At the Global Threat Center, all attention is suddenly drawn to internet intelligence expert Carter Schoenberg. He spotted something strange. A major electronic pipeline carrying the internet's traffic is being slowed down by a suspected hacker attack. It looks like it's following the time zones across the Pacific and heading for America. Indonesia uh, is pretty much getting slammed. It appears to be starting the Pacific Rim, making its way towards uh, North America. South America still seems to be okay, but um, it seems like it's making its way towards North America. It's a possible attack on the infrastructure of the internet itself. It appears that for whatever reason, whatever this causes, it's moving with the sun, starting the Pacific Rim, making its way towards the U.S. You're witnessing trench warfare on the internet. If the attack hits America as the working day gets underway, it could affect millions of people. If it hits the North American continent like it's been hitting everybody else, then anybody that has their attachment to the pipeline, any pipeline, would probably um, see some significant degradation. All traffic relying on the suspect internet pipeline could fail. Carter makes an urgent check call to their sister station in Southeast Asia. As he does, both stations simultaneously see the pipeline recover, and the incident is over as quickly as it appeared. It was just one of these anomalies, but it's an anomaly that when it happens, we were on top of it right when it occurred, and we were able to bring it to everybody's attention. It's unclear what role, if any, may have been played by hackers. But for several minutes, it looked like exactly the kind of attack that the White Hats fear most, an electronic Pearl Harbor. The real threat of a deliberately launched info war. Info war is very real, and the possibility of info war being used in coordination with a, an attack in the electronic Pearl Harbor um, is absolutely a possibility and um, is an event that we effectively think we're waiting to happen. For much of the 1990s, the computers of the United States military were defended against such an attack by a team led by Bob Ayers. I was director of the U.S. DoD Defensive Information Warfare Program. So if you think of the security program as keeping individuals out, think of the Defensive Information Warfare Program as designed to keep nation states out of DoD systems. Hackers are already working for over a hundred foreign governments. 127 nation states have an active offensive information warfare program underway. In the mid-1990s, one of the United States' most secret military projects, the Stealth Bomber, became the target of hackers. Leaks of its specifications were highly sensitive. Extremely sensitive. It's sensitive to this very day. At the time, the, the existence of the aircraft was, was known. However, any of the characteristics or any even the, the image of the aircraft itself was not known. So it was an item of, of high curiosity. The secrets of the stealth technology were held on computers at the Rivers Air Force Base in Rome, New York, home to the Air Force Research and Development Laboratories. A uh, system administrator at Griffiths Air Force Base in New York uh, noticed the attacks taking place. He noticed it three days after they began. And as soon as he noticed it, he reported it to, to my organization, and the, the reaction process then began. They knew the secrets of the stealth project were being hacked into, but they didn't know who was doing it. There was a great deal of uh, concern evidence by these attacks because the U.S. didn't know where they were coming from. It's a classic difficulty for the White Hats. Hackers make perfect spies because they can hide in the shadows of cyberspace. 
The problem is uh, hackers typically come through multiple uh, launch points. And so they, they kind of play hopscotch on the internet. You see typically the last um, IP address that they uh, came from into your network and that will resolve back to some computer that they have hacked into and taken over uh, for the purposes of masking who they really are. It's very difficult to go back through the chain of hops to find the actual source. So the technical attempts to, in the terms of the day to hack back to find the source failed. Who could have wanted such information? The immediate suspects were hostile foreign powers. But in fact, the hackers who got under the radar of the most sophisticated spying technology ever built were teenagers sitting at home in London, England. The young men that were launching these attacks, they didn't go from London, which is the environment they were in, directly to New York. They'd go from London, through South Africa, through Mexico, and then to the United States. Technology in the global hacker community have expanded rapidly in the years since the stealth bomber attacks. At that time, the Department of Defense calculated the total number of intrusions into its systems. The figure was extraordinary. Over a quarter of a million times in 1995, someone other than a DOD employee was in charge of the DOD system. Now, if that isn't the foundation for an electronic Pearl Harbor, I don't know what is. Seven years later, new technology brings a constant set of new vulnerabilities. Chris O'Farrell is a white hat who protects the U.S. government systems and sees himself as a foot soldier in a never-ending daily battle. Definitely there's a battle between the black hats and the white hats. Uh, it's an, it's an ever-ongoing battle. It's like digging a hole in the sand. The more and more you work, the more and more it fills up. Vulnerabilities are found every day. Chris is on the side of the angels, but today, He's setting off on what hackers call a war drive. He's heading for the heart of the federal government to expose a new way in for hackers created by the growing use of wireless networks. We use the same techniques, methodologies, and all that hackers use in order to basically secure networks for uh, the U.S. government, financial institutions, and uh, other types of agencies. As well as countless corporations, a host of government departments use wireless networks, vulnerable to hackers on the outside, equipped with a simple rig. All that you need to put together a war driving rig is what they call it. I have a GPS receiver. I have my antenna and my wireless card, which I piece together here. You can tell it's been used quite a bit. What Chris calls a war drive is an electronic fishing expedition looking for vulnerable wireless networks. Every time you hear a beep on the computer, you know it's another wireless network. There you go. I just found a couple. Up on Capitol Hill, you'll just start going crazy. It'll sound like a pinball machine in here. There's one. Got another one. By glancing at the screen, Chris can instantly assess how long it would take him to hack into any of the wireless networks, broadcasting their presence onto the streets of the capital. Most of them are not even encrypted to protect them. Right now, I have 20 networks on my computer. Out of the 20, only six of them have encryption. It would take me probably about 20 seconds out of 14 out of the 20 networks for me to reconfigure my wireless card and enter these networks. They can spend millions of dollars on security, have firewalls, and have all kinds of internal policies, but it only takes one person with one wireless access point to plug in. Anybody sitting where I am in my car right now can break into a government network in about 20 seconds. Well, what I've seen today really disturbs me. I don't understand why there's wireless access points beaconing out these signals out onto the roads, out into the parking lots of these government buildings in Washington, D.C. But hackers don't have to be on the doorstep to engage in info war. 
Chinese president tells me has urged the United States to stop all spy flights near China for the sake of healthy development of China-U.S. relations. Following the collision of a Chinese fighter with a U.S. spy plane, angry hackers from China launched a hacker war against the U.S. Chinese hackers banded together, and, and for a period of a week, they showed solidarity and compromised over 10,000 U.S. systems in a period of a week. So we saw that basically a, a loose group of, of hackers with one common political motivation can cause significant damage. The first wave of attacks was followed by the release of a new type of virus, an attack worm. Apparently launched from China against systems set to American English, it became known as Code Red. Viruses spread among computer systems just the way cold spread among, you know, uh, grade school classrooms. Code Red imitated the actions of a hacker and used compromised systems to break into other systems. Significant portions of the internet were uh, either disabled or infected as a byproduct of the rapid propagation of the code red worm. This propagation was so dramatic and so fast uh, and the cascading effect of hundreds of attacks coming from each infected computer simply overwhelmed the, the internet. Code red was set to stop and start when the internal computer clocks hit certain dates and times. We noticed that, okay, it stops propagating when the system clock in the computer turns to the 20th of the month. It begins a new phase of activity, and that phase of activity, as we discovered, was to launch a distributed denial of service attack against the White House website. The attack was tracked back to a Chinese university. In the last line of, of the software code, it says, hacked by Chinese. The White House simply changed the numbers in their web address, but Code Red had a lasting impact. Code Red was potentially a test to see if automated info war would work. If other key components of the internet infrastructure had been targeted by Code Red instead of just a web server, we could have seen massive amount of damage. It was the most serious episode in the health of the internet, in the history of the internet. While cyber terrorism is regarded as an inevitable threat for the future, the reality today is that the bulk of hackers who break into high profile sites have a less alarming motivation. Department of Defense in the, in the United States, of course, is, a, is like the, the Mount Everest of, of, of uh, you know, the, the targets that you can go after. I planted my flag in a Pentagon uh, computer system. You know, that's a wonderful thing. They really didn't want to hurt the Pentagon uh, computer system. They didn't want to look at any information. They just wanted to get it in there and get it planted and then brag about it amongst their peers. Such recognition seems to have driven the teenager who was branded one of the world's most notorious hackers. Online, he's known as Coldfire. He keeps his real name secret. His face is not yet famous, but his hacker exploits have made him a cyberspace celebrity. Chris is the most notorious hacker. The most people who were involved in the, um, in the hacking community and a lot of the people that were involved in the uh, security industry would know my name straight away. I said I'm so famous and they'd be for fame. Yeah, it feels great. Ask a film star how they feel about being famous. Coldfire was branded Britain's most notorious hacker after he electronically broke into the computers at a major cell phone company. He then rerouted calls from his phone so that they were billed to other people. Obviously hacking is a uh, criminal offence and the people that are doing it need to uh, remain anonymous. But not only that, you get uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of jealousy from the, uh, the kiddies trying to uh, get up to your level and uh, they'd like want to find out who you are, get more details on you, that sort of thing. So that's why uh, most of us at the top would uh, prefer to remain anonymous. Analyzing the behavior of hackers like Coldfire is a full-time job for Eric Raymond. He calls himself a hacker anthropologist. 
His work reveals a side of their culture and philosophy that's part of a bigger battle for cyber rights and how hackers are understood by the wider world. I describe myself as a wandering anthropologist and troublemaking philosopher and for more than 20 years I've been part of the culture of internet hackers and I've both functioned within that culture and tried to describe it to other people. Let's see, we've got, we've got the guest machine over here. Eric is part of the core hacker tradition. We have a fold-out bed down here where hackers uh, sometimes stay when they come to visit, and uh, we provide them with all the courtesies. They're driven by a clear set of hacker ethics. They share their programs and resist domination by big commercial software companies. World Domination Central. Hackers like Eric rarely stray into systems where they're not invited. I haven't done anything like that since... 1977. Uh, there have been once, once or twice since then that I have broken into systems just to verify that a vulnerability was there, but proper hacker courtesy is to immediately notify the system administrators that the hole was present and how to plug it. Well, those two are from Korea. He studies his subjects like they're a part of a remote and colorful tribe. And those two are from Indonesia. But he doesn't like what all of them do. In fact, he tries to disown those like Coldfire and Captain Zap, who give hackers a bad name. What's more, he wants them renamed, not hackers, but crackers. Crackers are people who break into computer systems and commit vandalism and computer crime. Uh, they're generally neither very bright nor very skilled. Um, you can distinguish them from hackers by the fact that they typically use pseudonyms or handles to describe their identities. Hackers don't do this. But the real difference is more fundamental. Um, hackers make things. Crackers only know how to break them. The Hacker's Bible, written by Eric, is the new Hacker's Dictionary. It sums up the hacker ethic he wants the world to understand. But Eric's battle to give the outlaws a new name has launched him into a war of words with another dictionary. In Oxford, England, the use of the word hacker is being reassessed for the next edition of the oldest and biggest dictionary in the English language, the Oxford English Dictionary. As part of the research, Nick Shearing has Eric's dictionary on his desk, but he's decided to disagree with Eric about what a hacker is. I think most people who use English throughout the world would understand a hacker to be someone who breaks into a computer system. But this is a misuse of the word, according to Eric, and he's determined to fight for his definition. Hackers build software, they uh, maintain the internet. Uh, hackers are the culture that invented the World Wide Web as we know it today. Um, we make stuff and we improve the world. It's very hard to make people choose a certain word to, to describe a phenomenon when there is already a word existing, which unfortunately for the people who object to hacker being used is hacker. The culture of internet hackers owns the word hacker and, and a lot of the slang that's associated with it. The fact that people outside that culture use it incorrectly is not a word to change its meaning. But despite Eric's mission, the exploits of the black hats seem to have demonized all hackers. A hacker is somebody who enters the system without authorization. Hackers today are electronic juvenile delinquents. I don't like being confused with a group of people who, by and large, I think are incompetent and unimaginative. Behind his war of words is a hacker battle that's serious. Eric fears for the future of cyber rights if the public fails to learn the difference between hackers and the computer criminals he calls crackers. I think it's important for people to understand that the, computer, the, the culture of computer hackers is a benign one. Otherwise, to the extent that we are confused with criminal crackers, uh, we become a justification for bad laws and for censorship and repression. <laughs> Fear that interfering lawmakers want to take over cyberspace has driven John Perry Barlow's life as a hacker with a difference. He's the former songwriter for the Grateful Dead and the joint founder of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which lobbies for cyber rights. What we're dealing with is the battle between the future and the past, between the powers that were and the powers that have yet to be. 
He believes the internet represents a change in history as great as the Industrial Revolution, which brought us structures like the Brooklyn Bridge. He sums up this new world with his own declaration of independence for cyberspace. Governments of the industrial world, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome here. You have no sovereignty where we gather. You do not know us, nor do you know our world. Cyberspace does not lie within your borders. Your legal concepts of property, expression, identity, movement, and context do not apply to us. They are all based on matter, and there is no matter here. This philosophy has led John into a new hacker battle. John and the Electronic Frontier Foundation are supporting one of the most widespread and controversial forms of hacking. The hot commodity is stolen movies. The target is Hollywood. We want cyberspace to be as open to communications of all sorts as possible. The most eagerly awaited movie of 2002 was Star Wars Episode Two. As the clocks passed midnight into May 16th, it opened to moviegoers who had camped out for two nights to get a ticket. 27 hours. 18 hours. <laughs> but rewind by over a week, and hackers had already seen it and were already trading it on the internet. A week before the world premiere, this is the chat room where hackers are trading Star Wars. Once the pirates have stolen the movie, the hackers distribute it by breaking into the pipelines which power the internet. This is not just piracy. This depends on hacking because the commodity is the bandwidth. Pirates have to use what we refer to as the big pipes, the multi-gigabit internet backbone connections to transfer data. I've heard one major internet ISP referred to as the blockbuster video of the internet because their computers are so fast, so easy to hack, it's the best place to get movies. To help them fight back, Hollywood has cast a former FBI agent as their good guy. Ken Jacobson has a tough role. Almost every movie released by the Big Seven Studios is made available on the web by hackers. It's incredibly common. We have discovered that almost all of our movies, whether they are blockbusters or just regular movies, are up on the internet within 24 to 48 hours after the movie opens in the theaters in the United States. As the heroes of the movie battle it out on the big screen, the outlaws of cyberspace are fighting a battle of their own. It is certainly a hacker's battle. The hackers are the closest thing we have to troops outside of the lawyers that EFF employs to take the motion picture industry and the record industry to court. Uh, the hackers are the people who are literally going out there and, and breaking the encryption codes and, and unbottling the stuff that, that uh, needs to be accessible to, to everybody. It amazes me because these are people who would never, never ever consider walking into a uh, Tower record store or some other record store or a video store and walking out with a stolen CD or a stolen DVD or a stolen video cassette. But actually we'll go up on the internet and we'll take exactly the same product and we'll decide that it should be free and that it's not a theft that's occurred. The battles continue between the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the studios. But in the town that gave America so many of its heroic villains, the modern band of mischief-making outlaws seems to be having the last laugh. As the first generation of teenage hackers reach their 40s, 
The battle between the angels and the outlaws has enabled many of them to start making a living from their skills. Captain Zap has decided to cash in by switching sides. The hacker formerly known as Captain Zap has reinvented himself as Ian Murphy, Chief Executive Officer. The embodiment of Captain Zap in the business viewpoint. I'm a hacker. We might as well hack life to its fullest. We will create a civilization of the mind in cyberspace. May it be more humane and fair than the world our governments have built before. I might say that I've never hacked, but I can understand the thrill firsthand. You take a, a good close look at, at your average security person, he's a former black hat. I mean, in almost every case, you know, who still actually understands the thrill of it. Some people uh, like to bungee jump, some of them like to parachute, some of them like to you know, do all kinds of strange things, but. Um, uh, hackers, it's, 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 a, it's a rush. I'm sure they do it for the rush effect. Well, I think it's a good thing to do? No. Do I want my kids doing it? No. But can I sort of understand it? Yeah, I think I can. Your mind's going 100 miles per hour behind the scenes. You're thinking, I can do this, I can do that. I can explain that, I can do this, I can do that. And you can't sit still and not think about that. It's, it's always there in the back of your mind. You just need to do it. The battle between the Angels and the Outlaws seems set to continue. But hackers on both sides know that like many conflicts, it's between people that speak the same language, use the same tools, and play the same games. It's great. It's a, it's a wonderful thing to do. And it's, a, it's like permanent employment as well. We will spread ourselves across the planet so that no one may arrest our thoughts. So may I suggest that you make the best use of this documentary and express a little thoughts there in terms of the African issues. And you know that many, many good examples here. You can actually take it from the video and use it as the basis of your uh, creating your perspective as an argument, right? So Captain Sam, you know who he is now is the first generations of hacker. And you know the uh, next generations, I think it's very interesting. But uh, most of the perspective we got here is from the Western world. And we know that the descriptions of this documentary and many hackers now coming from the East inside China. All right? So um, if you know some sources which 
describe something like this from inside mainland China, why not share that with us, okay? Uh, we can understand Mandarin, okay? All right, now, um, make the best use of these wonderful resources and in writing the learning artifacts of your second learning contract, make the best use of them. Do not, do not, do not consider the learning artifacts that you have to come up for the second learning contract must be done rigidly. Although I have a reading list, I have a topic you have to choose, but as long as we use the material, remember the topic sentence you create, which is under the umbrella questions, okay, of the couple of wits, you can use those resources. Don't waste them, okay? But do not confine yourself in only this question called what, okay? What is just a big question where you can always develop your topic sentence, your real topic of interest. And um, I start seeing students understanding this flexibility instead of just saying, oh, the ultimate uh, artifact with the producer because there's steps, okay? The steps. You can take notes from this video, you can extract some arguments and develop an OIA package and share it with your learning partner. And then you can write a report based on a number of very interesting threads. And then finally come up with your own blog to tell the whole world what you know about us, okay? What's the best way of doing this? Okay, now we have a little bit time left. Then let me show you how to do it once you get the PowerPoint, okay? So this is a very good piece. Only four minutes. If you want to create, want a, want presentation to create a presentation on PowerPoint, that will run, that will run, or includes, includes audio, or audio file presentation, you can record, you can record the narration, narration of the accompanying the PowerPoint file. 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 First, when you're in normal view, select the thumbnail in the slides pane on the left for the slide in which you want the narration to begin. Then, click the slideshow tab in the top navigation. And in the setup group, click the button to record narration. PowerPoint will open a dialog box where you can adjust the levels and the quality of your recording. So first select the button to set the microphone level and specify the volume setting. Then click OK. Next, select the button to change quality and in the first drop down menu choose the quality for the recording. CD quality is the highest quality and telephone quality is the lowest. Of course, the higher the sound quality, the larger the file size. When you've made your selection, the attributes will change automatically and you can click OK. Now, down at the bottom of the dialog box, you can choose whether to link the narration recording to the presentation. Just check the box to link and then browse to select the folder in which you want to save the file. If you don't link the narration, it's actually embedded into your presentation. So by linking it, you can keep your presentation file at a manageable size. You just need to remember to save the link narration file to the same folder as your presentation on your hard drive or external media. Now it's time to start recording. As soon as you click OK in the dialog box, the slide that you chose as the first slide for your narration will open in slideshow view. Just an FYI, if you choose a slide other than the first one in your presentation to record your narration, you'll get a little pop-up box asking if you want to start recording from that slide or from the first slide. You can just speak your narration into the microphone and the audio will be recorded with that slide. When you're done with the narration for that slide, click on the slide to advance to the next one. Wherever you start, you can just keep recording the narration and clicking on the slide to advance to the next slide at the appropriate time in your presentation. If you need to take a breather at any point, just right mouse click on the slide that you're in and select pause narration. Then when you're ready to get rolling again, just right mouse click again and select resume narration. Once you've recorded your whole presentation and you get to the black screen that tells you you're at the end of the slideshow, click on that screen to save your narration. The dialog box will also ask you whether you want to save the slide timings with your narration. When you select Save, your presentation will appear in Slide Sorter view with the timings displayed under each slide. If you choose Don't Save, PowerPoint will still save your recorded narration but not the timing, and you'll just go back to the first slide. You may want to turn off the timing if it doesn't benefit the presentation, 
For example, if you accidentally included long pauses between slides, turning off the timing also gives the viewer the option to control the pacing. Now you can choose one of the buttons in the top navigation to run your slideshow from the beginning, or to select a slide and run it from that spot so you can test the timings and the recorded narration. If you decide that you want to run the slideshow with the narration but without the saved timings, select the Slideshow tab from the top navigation, and in the Setup group, select Setup Slideshow. You'll see here in the dialog box there's an option to advance slides manually instead of with the recorded timings. Depending on your audience, you can also choose the Show Type and Show Options here on the left. And when you're done making your selections, click OK. It's a very simple uh, way to do something, uh, making things easier, making the best use of the PowerPoint software. We have over at the University of EDUOTES because each student is entitled to use uh, its store, this uh, free of charge PowerPoint stuff in your own computer, uh, even in your home computer. So I think it's very good that you try to make the best use of it. Now, uh, I would like to wish you a very good and happy Chinese New Year's holiday after this class and you're most of you go home. <coughs> so allow me to take attendance just before you leave, okay? So, but to those of you who have done the sharing in class, like uh, Sammy and Anna, make sure you leave a record in the public discussion forum in the week, okay, where you did it. I think mean, Sammy did it, and then remember to do it, because if you forgot, it's going to be difficult for you to extract the record towards the end of the semester and put them together. It's better when you do it now or before the Chinese New Year's holiday. Don't forget, okay? And, um, and I highly encourage the rest of you to sign up for your subsequent class in class sharing. You need 10 such records in order to earn a full score, okay? So don't miss the 20 points of your final 100 points. Uh, if you share it in class, it's the best way to earn the score, okay? Uh, remember, during the course active learning activity, there are different course artifacts you need to produce. Some of the course artifacts, like the first, the first learning contract, second learning contract, I would grade them according to the assessment rubric. That is a big challenge, okay? You will hardly get the full score because you need some room for improvement. But for in-class participation, this thing, as long as you do it, you got full score, okay? So in order to balance out your, your ups and downs of score, it's highly recommended that you take the best uh, advantage of the in-class participation to earn your full score first, okay? And then later on, you can do a one or two bonus work, so this will go and cover some of the low points in your scoring. Because sometimes, if you look at the assessment rubric, the challenge for you to learn how to write a report based on those criteria is high, okay? And this is the purpose of give you a challenge, and then, which is also the purpose to support you for that. In every course design, each instructor will always do the challenge and support context, okay? When you are challenging, when you're being challenged to do a homework assignment, it's expected to reach the standard. And sometimes, the first time you do it, you may not reach the standard. So you might be a little bit discouraged. But in the design of the learning experience, we have the other assessment item by this in-class participation, which give you 20% for the free learning contract all together just 30%. So you need to learn how to balance out, okay? This is the way of life, all right? Learning sometimes takes a learning curve. So uh, I will start grading your work in the first learning contract probably by the study today and end it by the school, uh, Sunday. So you should see the, the kind of expectations. But make sure you hit my advice. The different activities in this course, which will allow you to earn points relatively easily as you can engage, they are those challenging activities, just like the learning contract, which will challenge you to reach the point. But overall, the points will, um, is not big enough to let you discourage. But do not be discouraged on an item by item score. And this is the process of learning. It's very important. Okay? So don't miss out the, <coughs> the points. Uh, you can earn directly from in-class participations. Uh, Angel is not here today. Uh, John C is not here today. Horace is not here today. Andy, you're here, right? Andy? Andy? Not here today? <laughs> okay, Anna is here. Annie? Thank you. Uh, Billy is not here today. Uh, Gaius? Thank you. Uh, Timmy? Thank you. 
Bryson is here. Okay, that's very good. Uh, Sammy is here. Nancy is here. Sophie. Sophie is not here today. Okay, and then Edward is here. Okay. So, do you know, do, or do you remember that um, mainly in the second learning contract is still the peer work, but at the end of the second learning contract, I expect that the team you have formed will do one digital story using the technique I just saw you on PowerPoint based on the topic, the four of you in your team is going to be saying, okay, this is a good topic. So you need some kind of interactions, all right? And the deadline for that is March the 7th, all right? So now it's February the 12th. Okay, you have two weeks time, enjoy your Chinese New Year holiday, and when you come back, you have one more week to get it done, okay? Have you found your team yet? Have you reported your team formations to me yet? Through Douglas <coughs> the hotline last week? If not, make sure you send me this posting by Dr. Bart's Q&A hotline for this week, okay? All right, that's it for today's CISG 113, Section 1, Information Security and Privacy. On February the 12th, 2015, the last class before enjoying our Chinese New Year's holiday, and when you come back, it will be week number seven, okay? Let's take a look at week number seven. It's about, again, we talk about the ethical issues of hacking and cracking, and then we come to information fraud. And just a preview, if you have time, you can um, take a look at the, the next figure we're going to introduce to you, out of the capital set, it's the Kelvin Vindic, okay? It's called the Social Engineering Master. It's a very interesting story, all right? So, okay, any question? If not, we're going to post the class today, and you can go freely. Another time, we're going to go to the next class, but if you have questions, you can stay behind. I'm going to answer your question. Okay, thank you very much.